Hi there, come on in. I'm Fred Trost, and you know, it's a pleasure for me to do a show like Michigan Outdoors. One thing that I'm thankful for is that I do live in the state of Michigan where we have the fishing and the hunting opportunities that we have. I think all of us, especially on Thanksgiving, can be thankful for that. But deer season, you know, is still with us. Big bucks are still in a lot of people's minds and what to do with those deer, how to cook them and prepare them, and that's all a part of deer hunting. We're gonna talk about that on this edition of Michigan Outdoors. And we're gonna have our mailbag, outdoor headlines, and a lot more. So you just stay where you are you're probably on the couch, you're stuffed and can barely keep your eyelids open, but hang with us for the next half hour because it's Thursday night, time for Michigan Outdoors. Scott Hurtley. Scott Hurtley, you don't look like you're old enough to hunt. <laughs> Gonna be, I'm 13 now, I'll be, I'll, I'll be old enough to hunt next year. What'd you do, just practice today? Yeah, I went, out, I went with my dad. Did you see anything? Yeah, I saw, we was walking down, down uh, we was on Jeff Row, we was going to get some water up in town here. And we saw, I saw one go over like that. And we, we got out of the truck and we waited to see if it had horns. And we was, we was going out to the blind again. And we saw five go across. Mm -hmm. And we was, we, we wasn't close enough to them to see if there's any horns. But at the last one that went across, we saw that it had, it was kind of low and it might have been a. a could buck. be, could be. They sneak up on those does, mm -hmm. you know. Now, what is a 13-year-old doing a blind all day? <laughs> Read comic books. No, he <laughs> watches for other deer and he tells us just. Does his homework, huh? Does homework with his dad. Well, great. Hey, I want to see you out there next year. I want to see your buck on the pole, okay? Mm -hmm. All right. And you know, there's a very good chance that next year Scott will come up with a buck, maybe a trophy buck. Every year on our big buck night, which is going to happen two weeks from tonight, we have hunters, all kinds of hunters with all kinds of bucks. But it's amazing how many of these hunters are first first-time deer hunters that have gone out for their first year, have seen a monster buck just by luck. Maybe their buddies set them up in a spot that was particularly good, but these deer are fun to look at. This isn't what deer hunting is all about, but it's certainly a fun, glamorous uh, thing to look at, a big buck rack. It's exciting, at least, and we have this every year. Now, if you have gotten a big buck or know somebody who has, all you have to do is get them to register with the DNR. The DNR runs a big buck contest. Fill out the form, score it yourself, send it in. We'll be checking with the DNR a few days ahead of our big buck show. We're going to take the top 12 or 14 bucks, invite them down here to share their stories with everybody. And that's going to be a lot of fun. Big buck night, something we always look forward to. When we have 12 or 14 hunters, make the headlines, Bob. That's right. They will make the headlines. But frankly, Fred, there's something very tragic in the headlines this week. That's right, Bob. You know, a lot of people don't understand hunting, and I'm, I'm sympathetic, really, to some of the anti-hunters who are against senseless killing of animals. I don't think anybody, even a hunter, disagrees with that. But hunters do not get a thrill out of going out and shooting an animal and killing it. You know, this is something that's big in the minds of anti-hunters, but the joy of hunting is, as you watch Michigan Outdoors over the past couple years, you realize that there's so much to it, and the kill is the difficult part. That's that's and it, that's the final the the final sort of challenge. It's not the challenge. No, it, it isn't. It's something that has to be done if we want to have any wild game recipes. If we want to have anything on the wall to look at, any mounts, a lot of wildlife art and so on. You know, comes from the the mounted animals, and it's just all a part of the hunting experience. And I think those people in Maine who were against the moose hunt, you know, they don't want moose to overpopulate. But they don't realize that every single moose, every single deer is going to end up laying in the woods, laying as a carcass in the woods. I prefer as a hunter to have a chance to harvest those animals, take them home, put them in the freezer so we can eat them. But you know, Fred, the interesting thing about this is, is if Minnesota game biologists hadn't done their homework and were able to uh, say they were short of funds mm -hmm. and weren't able to present that argument to the public that there is indeed a problem with moose and they have to be cropped off much like, you know, mm -hmm. harvested much like an agricultural product, that would have, I'm sure, gone down to defeat on the main ballot. Well, that's, that's our job here at Michigan Outdoors, and hopefully you're with us to explain hunting to a lot of people because it's just another form of agriculture. It's something that occurs out in the wild, something that I'm proud to be a part of. Eddie, let's lighten up a little bit now All right. and uh, get some letters out here from our mailbag. Okay, here's a question on pheasant hunting. Will you please tell the DNR Commission that I personally would like to see put take pheasant hunting to continue. If it takes an increase in cost to me, that is fine. Until a pheasant restoration program is working, this is the only way I know of to really enjoy pheasant hunting. Well, Paul, you, you, you raised the same point that over 100 viewers of Michigan Outdoors that are put take hunters raised with us. 
And I took those uh, comments and suggestions over to the Natural Resources Commission meeting and reported on those to the Natural Resources Commission. And I can tell you now, it looks like we've got an interim pheasant program, not put take reestablished yet, but an interim pheasant program that'll probably put out 40,000 birds for the public next year and they will, it will be mostly conducted on state game areas. So, because viewers wrote, because they called, we got some action out of the Natural Resources Commission. Should they keep it up? You bet, it okay. works. All right, it's a question on fishing laws. I think when you catch a fish, if it swallowed the hook and is not legal size, and if it would die, you should keep it. I think it releasing the fish is a waste. Well, you know, that's true. It seems that way, and it is a waste in a sense, because a lot of the small fish uh, that are taken, we're talking to trout, you know, maybe five or six inches long. They're not that great to eat. I mean, well, they, I don't even want to get into that. <laughs> they are kind of tasty, but they're not really big enough to be practical. Uh, we don't want to harvest them, so, Duane, we have to toss them back, and we want everybody to do that. Otherwise, I think if we relax the rule, and said, that said that if the fish is going to die anyway, you can keep it. There's a lot of people that would keep a lot of fish thinking, well, they'll probably die, and they wouldn't. So we'll have a lot more wasted by relaxing the rule than if we let the critters in the streams feed on the carcasses, because it's all a part of nature. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to shift gears here to uh, back to deer season, talking about the opening day. Opening day was, uh, what do you say, rained out? Well, it, it's almost like the entire deer season was rained out so in far. respect or not. So, so far. far. We're, change in weather here and we'll maybe pull it out of the bag. But let's go up to a famous watering hole up in Grayling and talk to a biologist about this. Well, one good place to talk about hunting is always a, a nice watering hole and we're probably the most famous in Grayling, Spikes Keg and Nails, sharing a pitcher of water <laughs> with Gary Bushell. Well, Gary, you're the regional biologist up here, the wildlife biologist for the yes. northern lore. You've been talking with Tom Prodzik and a lot of your biologists, Tom mm -hmm. Havard. Right. What is your conclusion? Well, basically, right now, uh, it looks like we're having fewer hunters. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, distribution of hunters is light, and the kill is light right now. Well, I know, I don't know about fewer hunters down around Houghton Lake. Mike Ignat said that he thought there were maybe more hunters this year, mm -hmm. but there were less shots that he heard mm -hmm. opening day this year than last year. Mm -hmm. And the kill seems to be down mm -hmm. significantly, mm -hmm. although I don't really find the hunters complaining about it. Well, for one thing, uh, they're just shooting bucks this year. Mm -hmm. uh, we reduced our antler take by 50%. Mm -hmm. And the deer that uh, are being taken are bucks. What's the condition? The one that I saw looked to be in pretty good condition. Mm -hmm. It had about four and a half inch spikes, which is an indication of a, of a deer that isn't. A yearling buck should have bigger antlers than that, but it looked like a pretty good sized buck. Well, 80% of the bucks taken in northern lower Michigan are, are yearling deer. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but somehow or another, we still get the two, three, four-year-old bucks that are really monster bucks, mm -hmm. really nice looking bucks for this part of the area. What are the factors? That, now the weather, frankly, I don't think the weather's that bad myself. I like mm -hmm. a drizzle, mm -hmm. uh, overcast. The deer seem to come out later and keep moving during the day. Mm -hmm. A lot of the hunters don't like that. The uh, weather is a, a key factor with hunters. If uh, they get wet, they're mm -hmm. miserable, chilled they tend to pull out of the woods early. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I, I like that. I like them up moving around. <laughs> I, I agree with you on that, too. And, and actually, it wasn't that bad. Uh, we had a mixture of rain and snow this morning. How w Did you have much snow in the northern area? We had snow around Houghton Lake. Snow cover. Road. Snow oh, yeah. cover and uh, mixed with rain. Mm -hmm. But uh, we had tracking snow, for sure. What about that elk? Somebody was trying to check in an elk. I heard it the district <laughs> office. In Ross Common, uh, apparently some folks are going through with a pickup truck that had a set of elk antlers draped with oh. uh, a deer hide. <laughs> Just a joke. Right. Well, right. a few pranks pulled at this time of year up here. Well, that sounds good. I guess in summary, you would summarize it as a biologist here on the opening day afternoon as down? Well, I, th it's, I think it's down. It, and uh, as we anticipated before the season, uh, it was going to be down. Mm -hmm. But, uh, of course, there's it, still another it, 14 days left. And it's not a washout either. Yeah. A lot of people are having fun. Of course, that's what it's all about, having fun, enjoying ourselves outdoors. And a lot of you folks, like me, are spending the rest of the season in southern Michigan, down around home, or if you're in the UP, you're sticking closer to your towns, you know, out on the back 40. It's, and It's a place to go. Oh, it is. There's some big deer down there. Let's go to a film that I shot when I was working with Morton F. back in 1969. And this is of Reuben Lesser. He won the Big Buck Contest back in 1969. He won it in 1968. So in 1969, I was 
Uh, my job was to tag along with him. Now, that's not Reuben there. This is one of the other hunters who was illustrating what it's like on a drizzly day in 1969. That was 14 years ago, but it looks like the same type of opening week of deer season. Watch what this doe does. Runs across the field, stops just before she gets to the woods. Very common characteristic of white-tailed deer. And that's exactly the same thing that Reuben Lesser's buck did before going into the woods. So oftentimes you can wait for a shot. Don't shoot while it's running. Wait till that deer stops. Checking the southern farm country, the story is the same now as it was back in 1969. Reuben is out in one of his fields. He's a farmer down around Chelsea. Look at the deer track. Wow. That's a lot of venison that, uh, standing in that hook right there. And that's what we were hunting in 1969. And a lot of hunters will be using this technique this coming weekend, where several hunters like Reuben was on a stand while other hunters walked through the woods to see if they could scare out a deer to Reuben. Now, what are your chances of being in the right spot at the right time? Well, Reuben was in 1968. Look at that buck. That won Morton F's big buck contest. And here's Reuben in 1969. What are the chances of him getting a big buck again? Well, as I was standing there, I couldn't get an over-the-shoulder shot, but I saw the buck running across the field. Reuben shot four times as it ran. The buck stopped by the side of the woods. Reuben took his last shot, and he caught it. That was a 10-point buck. Incredible luck. You don't often have a cameraman behind you at a time like that. <laughs> Reuben was happy. He got on his uh, little CB radio, the walkie-talkie, and called to some of the other hunters that he has a deer. Excellent move, Reuben. You see, Reuben is a farmer, and he knows you want to field dress that deer right away, clean it out. In fact, Reuben, as I recall, butchers the deer the same day. He doesn't hang him. That's always a good idea. I think so. I don't That's think aging, idea. because venison does not have intramuscular fat, that aging venison does not really help that much. Some hunters may disagree. Write me a letter. We'll put it in the mailbag. But I have data to, to say that it doesn't on white-tailed deer. Reuben tagged this 10 point. It's not big enough to win a contest, but I tell you, look at the hunters around there. This was before Hunter Orange, so we were just in Hunter Red. But that was a nice buck. Everybody admired it. This is a, fellas like this are gonna be on our big buck night. There they are. I tell you, that's, it's fun just to look at those films, think about it, you know, Imagine that maybe that'll be us. Maybe yet this year. Well, there'll be a lot of guys out driving this weekend. Yeah, well, I'm going to be out there too, enjoying myself on that. But next thing we want to talk about now is what do you do with a deer after you know you feel dressed it and taken care of it? Uh, hanging is not that necessary, and you can butcher it yourself. All you need is a knife. A knife. That's it. No bone saws. Nothing else. And if you take that knife and just Follow it, filleting it like a fish, you'll be okay. I talked with Sam Grissom up in Alpena at the bow hunting camp up there, and Sam butchers a deer the same way I do, so of course I think his method is perfect. Mm -hmm. You would. <laughs> yeah, let's go back and run through it right now. But looking at this, now that we have it done, you've taken, we saw how we took off the front leg, which is essentially the chuck. This is the entire chuck from which many chuck roasts are made on a steer, and what you've done is boned it out. And of course, there's the shoulder blade, boneless. On the lower leg here, this meat goes into the burger pile. Right. For grinding. But on the top blade here, we're going to put that in our bone bucket. And this is what comes out as chuck and a shoulder roast. And you'd want to cut this off. Right. All of this membrane, all of this white tissue you want to remove. And what you've got to remember, that, you know, of course, as the animal is much smaller, you're looking at about an inch and a half, two mm -hmm. inches thick there. So you can slice it you know, like a chuck steak, but it's probably better just to take some cotton cord, roll this up, mm -hmm. and if you cut this portion off here, roll this up, and you have a nice little oh, it is. baby rolled rump roast, if you will. But I, I like to cook it even with the shoulder blade in it and make yeah. a good, good blade roast. Uh, coming down here over the ribs, of course, we've taken the ribs off, and what you want to do is score them down this side, break them, and you have some spare ribs. Now, you want to cook these, boil these, until you get the fat and the tallow out, then you can cook it with ketchup and coke like we've done before, barbecue them, right. however you want. But those are tasty that way. Otherwise, you have some tough going mm -hmm. because that's, there's not it's a whole lot of meat. Not a lot there, but it's very tasty meat once you go to the trouble to utilize it properly. Now, above the ribs, we're getting into what we call the fillet. Uh, this is our uh, outside loin, the one that occurs along the back. This would be sirloin at this end, moving up to your T-bone portion, and then these would be rib steaks. This is all there would be on the rib steak of a deer, all the meat. Okay, and as you can see, all of that stripping 
white, tough, sinuous material. We've taken the time to remove all of that, and it vastly improves the quality oh. of the meat. Now you have nothing but just pure, edible, super product. Oh, it is. This is terrific. In fact, this tastes better. A lot of people talk about what they would call the, the uh, inside loins, the tenderloin, and this little strip back strap occurs right on the inside. This is the small portion of the T-bone or porterhouse right. steak on the small side of the bone. And this is how big the whole thing is on a deer. It's very tender but it doesn't have a lot of flavor, really. Also, the thing that, that a lot of people, where they make their mistake on it, this piece of meat should actually be pulled almost immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see how small and how thin it is. And, of course, it's in the inside. You've got the chest cavity opened up to cool down your deer. Well, what that does, you can see a little has already set in here where it started to dry out. Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of people like to hang their deer three, four, five days, weather permitting. So pull this those out early. This little strap would just become so tough that mm -hmm. it would really be a tremendous waste. So but take it out immediately. It's a tender piece of meat if you like tender meat. Not a lot of flavor, but cook it in butter, right. saute it. it. Butter. It's, it's scrumptious that flavoring. way. Now we're up to we're working down towards the hind leg, the hind quarter, and taking these muscles off of the bone mm -hmm. like you've done, here they are. This is what it looks like. This is what would be the round, and here we'll take this as the back leg. We'll put that in the mm -hmm. bone bucket. There's a lot of meat here, but you don't want to just cut indiscriminately and cook all of this fat and the sinew and the silver skin and the fell, all of this membrane in here. This you can is see, as you're starting oh. to, to pull that apart, what you're doing right now is you're forming yourself a beautiful little roast. Right there, you can almost right pull there. it apart. You can just almost pull it apart, a few little cuts. And this is what you want to do, butchering yourself. You don't have to know the names of the muscle groups. You don't have to work from a chart. You can just work from the muscles on the deer, take My them apart. My sons call this the football roast. The football roast. Eh? Which, for lack of a better name. Sure. And again, we're not making any comparison to cattle. So football roast is good enough. And indeed, mm -hmm. there's a little football. This is what would be the round. And you've cut up this right here into what would be round steaks. Right. And there they are. They're, they're very tender. They're really just as good almost as this loin. Not quite as tender. Uh, but I say not quite as tender. We're talking about a piece of meat here that is this, there's no comparison. There's yeah, I mean, it's scrumptious. Now, this is the pile of meat that you have off the rest of the leg of the hind quarter. Mm -hmm. And I find that if you take the time to take the fat and the right. fell off of there, that it's going to be every bit as tasty as anything else, except it's time consuming. It's very time consuming. What I like to do with these pieces, as you, as you can see too, you've got the larger muscle groups. Mm -hmm. This one right here, this that's, outside that's muscle right. group, you can slice this one. Mm -hmm. Break it right here, slice this one off. You get a steak approximately that wide, so long, makes a nice little steak. Uh, then the rest of it, what I do is if it's large enough to slice, it's a steak. Mm -hmm. If it's not large enough to, for a steak, I'd like to cube these portions mm -hmm. because it's excellent meat. And if you're going to make stew, don't use the, the cheaper cut of oh, the no. animal, like from the, the lower portion of the, of the foreleg. Use that for your grind. These nice pieces retain for your stew meat. Well, here's what you've done. You've done this with some of the loin, but you could do this with the leg too. Nice uh, pieces without any fat, without any... Uh, fell or silver skin on them, and, and these are tender, and I mean tender, folks. If you have this, you won't know you're eating venison, and your friends won't either. But here's a portion where a lot of people go wrong. Now, if you take this, this is off of the forelegs. This is down on what would be called the shank, uh, the pieces of meat that people toss in for burger. You cannot grind this no. at home on a home grinder. No, that what's going to happen is all of this sinuin is just going to plug the grinder. It is. But you want to bear in mind, if you take this out to a commercial grind, grinding place, a butcher, and have him grind it for you, if this will plug your home grinder, it will plug your teeth when you go to eat it. <laughs> that's right. That's so exactly right. So take the time right. to, to trim this meat up, even if it takes you a couple of hours. This, you know, this is a once-a-year project. Why not spend the time to do it properly? Yep. You can sit down in front of the TV and take these pieces of meat and cut out all the fat and all of the sinewy flesh. My wife don't let me take venison in the living room. She doesn't let you no, do that? No. Well, you can do that in the kitchen. Get a portable right. TV. Bring it in. But it's something to do. And this might take a while. But if you don't, and if you grind this up, you serve it as burger, you try to, you try to cook it even with a moist method of cookery, the flavor is going to be off, and it's going to be tough, and your friends are going to say, um, you know, no thanks, I'm full. I've found from personal experience, a lot of people, they take their, their grind and they have pork added to it because they, they claim it increases the flavor. 
Uh, we personally don't do anything like that. We spend the time to clean spend the, the deer, time to clean it cut up. that out, and when we grind it up, we have nothing but pure venison. We make the burgers out of 100% pure venison, and they're excellent. You, you bet. Well, here it is. This is a deer. Remember, it's not a steer. We're talking 30 to 40 pounds of meat that you get out of it. You can do it at home yourself. That's the beauty of it. And we'll have some recipes in our upcoming edition, which will be out in just about two weeks of our newsletter, the Michigan Outdoors Club Digest. We'll put some recipes in here and maybe slip one or two of your favorites in too, Sam. I'll be looking forward to it. Okay, great. Well, let's get some of this uh, wrapped up and in the freezer. Sounds good. Now remember, I said 30 to 40 pounds of meat. Some people think oh, it's a lot more than that on a deer. That's with the bone in it. I'm talking boneless meat, cut off the fat, cut off the fell. It'll be excellent, and you'll have between 32 and 35 pounds on an average 125, 130-pound deer. That, to me, guys, I love butchering deer. I enjoy I that part of the do. deer hunt. I could do that. You know, send me your deer. Put them, <laughs> ship them UPS to me, and I'll butcher them. I love doing it. UPS I also, isn't going to be happy. No, they aren't. But I also love cooking them. Let's go up to our outdoor fair in Houghton Lake this August, where I learned a great recipe in the microwave. We're here at the outdoor fair getting ready to open the microwave oven where Kay Ritchie is doing a new invention. What's going to pop out? It's been cooking for a minute. We're going to have teriyaki steaks. Okay. Teriyaki steaks. Now this was, as I understand it, the loin yes. of some venison, which we butchered right here for the crowd yesterday. Mm -hmm. Oh, that smells outstanding. What are you doing? Well, I'm just going to put a little bit of teriyaki sauce over the top of it. After then. it's done, huh? Yeah. I started it out by just uh, slicing it thinly. Mm -hmm. Would you like a piece of bread? Oh, a piece of bread? Okay. okay. Whatever you say. Go ahead, get me a good one there. And this is the loin of venison. Oh, boy. Oh, it's mm. tender. I can tell it's, it's tender. tender. It's tender. It's like filet mignon. Well, mm. really, that's about what it is. This is the inside This is scrumptious. And, th and this took one minute. One minute in the microwave. Cut very thin. Now, how did you do it? Start yeah. from the beginning. You took the loin. Mm -hmm. And it sliced thin. it very thin. It's thin. probably mm -hmm. less than a quarter of an inch. Mm -hmm. Laid it out. I put about a tablespoon of beef broth to keep the moisture in. Then I seasoned it with a Lowry seasoning salt and the seasoned pepper. Covered it with saran wrap, stuck it in the oven for a minute, brought it out, and sprinkled a little bit of teriyaki sauce mm -hmm. over it. That's it. Wow. This is how recipes are made. This is how it's done. Right here, an invention at the outdoor fair. Well, we got free samples here for you folks. Come on up and try some. Okay. I want an unbiased opinion. All right. There you go. Might as well just take it right there. Thank you. It's delicious. It's wild game. Mm-hmm. That's mine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I tell you, I, I, I miss not butchering a deer this year, and I'm going to try my best to get one. And with that recipe, you can use any piece of meat that doesn't have the fat or the fell on it. Any, any just straight piece of meat. That's Be great. Just cut super thin. Cut mm -hmm. thin. Cut thin. That's right. Mm-hmm. For all of us who enjoy the outdoors, we can be thankful that we live here in Michigan. And on this Thanksgiving Day, I'm also thankful that I'm in my third year on PBS. It's really great. And I hope you have a safe holiday and you're back to join me next week right here for another edition of Michigan Outdoors. What's this number, 23? 23. Okay. Go up the That's how we do it. Who got this? He did? He did over here? Yeah. Yeah. How many deer you gotten in your lifetime? Oh, that's the first one. <laughs> Is that right? Feel great, too. You do? Where are you from? Saginaw, Michigan. Now you can shave. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's I'm keeping that. Are you? Well, that's super. Where, where'd you get this? Got out in Maple Valley. Where's that? 10 o'clock. It's right in West Branch. Mm -hmm. 10 o'clock this morning. You brought him over here to Tux? Yep. What are you proud of? You gonna go sign autographs and shake hands with everybody here? <laughs> <laughs> What's your name? John Rydell. From where? Saginaw, Michigan. Saginaw, John, congratulations. Ah, uh, thank you, sir. Good buck. We all wish we were you right now. <laughs> <laughs>